This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to FISH 507, Applied Time Series Analysis, offered at the University of Washington. Today is the first lecture of the quarter, and so we'll be discussing a number of introductory topics, such as characteristics of time series, in particular, what actually is a time series, what are the different ways we use to classify time series, trends in time series, and here I should put trends in quotes, meaning I don't not simply a straight line or a parabolic function, and finally seasonality, or what will often refer to as periodicity, and this gets its name season from things such as quarterly data or monthly data, but it really could arise from any sort of temporal pattern. And then we'll end the lecture with the discussing the framework classical decomposition and what that means for us moving forward. Okay, starting off, what is a time series? Well, a time series is simply a set of observations taken sequentially in time. A time series can be represented as a set, and this is commonly the way you would see it written in a textbook or in a paper with a rigorous statistical description of a method. And a set uses these curly braces, on either side, and then we have values one, two, three, et cetera, up to some n number of values. So for example, here's a time series of length six, which were simply recorded sequentially. By way of example, this is a time series of the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide observed at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And as many of you are probably aware, over the last 70 years, the concentration has been increasing rapidly, and in fact appears to be doing so in a potential exponential manner, with also some variation around that in the seasonal aspect. And the seasonal variation is caused by the change in seasons between the northern and southern hemisphere and most of the photosynthesis in the northern hemisphere happening in the summer, and most of the respiration happening in the winter. Classification of time series. Well, the first way we classify time series is by some index set, that is the value of the time over which we recorded those. The first one we'll talk about applies to real time. And this might be a, a system such as a continuous flow of information through a a fiber optic cable or something and we randomly stick a turn a flip a switch at time point 1.1 and get back at 2.5 so any time in between there we may have observed some aspect of the time series more commonly however we classify time series by some index set over discrete time so these are actual values that we would record in such a manner as number of days, one, two, three, four, five. Those could be equally spaced. They may be equally spaced with some missing value. Here, this one is missing the third time period. Or they may be unequally spaced. Here, it's missing the one, the five, the seven, and the eight. And in the sense of the way things really work, these are sort of your unicorn data sets where you have no missing values. These are often encountered, but more typically, this is what we deal with in ecology and fisheries, the unequally spaced, more opportunistic sampling. We also classify time series by the underlying process. So it might be discrete, such as the total number of fish caught per trawl, or it may be some continuous measures, such as temperature or salinity. We classify time series by the number of values recorded. So these could be a univariate, excuse me, univariate response, scalar, such as the total number of fish caught in a trawl, or it could be multivariates, and we store those in a vector. And for example, that might be the number of each species of fish caught in a trawl. We classify time series by the types of values recorded. These might be integers, number of fish in a five minute trawl could be rational numbers, the fraction of unclipped fish. These tend to be relatively rare because it's a bit of a hassle to store both of these values in many data frames, but that's often the way we're thinking about it. 
They may be real, such as fish mass. And rarely in ecology and fisheries do we encounter complex numbers, but this is much more common in the engineering sciences, and we won't, for the most part, deal with them at all in this course. Moving on to statistical analyses of time series, most statistical analyses are concerned with estimating properties of a population from a sample. So, for example, we might use the fish caught in a seine to infer the mean size of all of the fish in a lake. But in the analysis of time series, however, we're dealing with a different situation. And that is, we might be able to vary the length of an observed time series, but it's often impossible to make multiple observations at a given point in time. So, for example, it would be impossible to observe today's closing price of Microsoft stock more than once. It simply is a, an, one value exists and that is it. We might read it from multiple sources, but they would be observing the exact same thing. Thus, conventional statistical procedures based on sort of large sample estimates are going to be inappropriate for time series. By way of describing time series, we often want to think about the sort of shapes of the, of the lot, the figure, if you will. So here's an example of the number of users connected to the internet through a particular router over uh, seconds. And what you see is early on this time series, it's very low. Then we see this rapid increase. And then there's a relatively constant period. Then this rapid decrease, a bit of lull, and then a rapid increase toward the end. Now that description is not very rigorous. It just involves adjectives and adverbs, but nevertheless, it does help us to try to understand what's going on there and what sort of things we might be looking at when it comes to trying to estimate uh, different models that we would apply to these types of data. Take, for example, this time series, the number of links trapped in Canada from 1821 to 1934. These are monthly values. They're very well known in some classic ecology textbooks. And they're characterized by these periods of big booms and busts in populations. And we think that those are related to the number of snowshoe hair, which also relates somehow to sunspot activity. What is a time series model? A time series model for a collection of X's is a specification of the joint distributions of a sequence of random variables, your capital, x of t, of which our set is thought to be a realization. Well, that's certainly a mouthful. What do I really mean by that? You can think about some joint distribution of random variable. So here are a bunch of random variables, time series of here 40. And in our case, we have but one realization of those. So we are trying to now describe, based on one realization, the distribution of everything This conference will now be recorded. Some simple time series models by way of example. Here's white noise, which is simply a variable x sub t distributed normally with mean zero and variance one. Here's an example of a very simple time series model, which we will actually rely on quite heavily in this course, a random walk. And it's called a random walk because the value today is simply the value yesterday plus some error term. And in this case, the error is again distributed as this white noise, mean normally with mean zero, variance one. And here are examples of random walks, all of which started relatively close to one another, but they tend to wander off through time. And if we had let this run over infinite space, this random, one of these random walks would have visited all points on this real line. Moving on to classical decomposition, this is simply can be thought of as a way of framing your different models. And by way of introducing this, we consider time series as a combination of a trend component, a seasonal component, and some remainder left over. And by trend, again, we don't simply mean 
linear. It could be something uh, odd shaped, but nevertheless, some sort of regular component to the data. Beginning with the trend, we need to a way to extract this so-called signal. And one common method is via so-called linear filters. And linear filters are just a balanced um, way of thinking about the value at some time t relaying some point into the past and into the future. Now here we're using an infinite index set, set excuse me, but in more commonly we'll rely on actual constrained values there. And the weights here will determine the influence of each of these different values around that. This should be an I. I'm sorry for that typo. For example, a moving average can be thought of as a linear filter. In this case, again, here we've moved from a minus to a plus discrete index set. And we're going to use 1 over two times that value plus one times this value offset by some negative lags and some positive lags. So for example, if a were to equal one, then m sub t will be one third, that would be one over two plus one, one third times x at t minus one plus x at t plus x at t plus one minus one to one, minus one to one. This is the form of moving average that Excel uses. If anybody has ever plotted a moving average trend using Excel. Here's an example of linear filtering using monthly airline passenger data from 1949 to 1960. So this is the number of people that are flying on airplanes. And simply it looks like this time series is characterized by this kind of increase in the overall trend, perhaps exponential, and also some sort of regular pattern here where these, these blips, there's these annual highs and annual lows with some sort of structure in between. If we passed a linear filter through there, we can start to see some sort of smoothing effect. So this is one, the first one we just looked at where we had that A value set to one. And so now here, the value at each time is equal to one third, the value last time, this time, and next time. Here's a filter where we're now up increasing that lambda to one over nine. And here's a case where it's one over 27. And there's a couple of points I'd like to make here. As you increase this value in the denominator so that you're spreading the the influence of any one value out over greater positive and negative time lags, it has a smoothing, a much more smoothing effect. So here we started out relatively close to the real data. Now we're starting to see some smoothing. This red one is barely catching these lumps here. And if we increase this denominator even more, we'd see that this got to be nearly a, a monotonically increasing line. The other thing I'd like to point out is that each time we do this, the resulting estimate of the filtered time series we get is shorter by that number of values. So here we lost one value on each side of the blue, because in order to compute the filter, you need one value ahead and one value behind. When we move to nine, we're trimming nine values off the front and the back, and then the, but 27, we're trimming nearly a month off of here each side of these. So at the expense of smoothing out this filter, you're also losing estimated uh, trends. Moving on to the seasonal effect, this is really easy because once we have an estimate of the trend, we can estimate the ST simply by subtraction. So the ST here is going to equal the observation minus this trend noting that this st also contains the error term because remember that there's an actual these would be in order to truly get the st we would have xt minus mt minus the et but for now we're going to include that in the seasonal component so here it is once we've subtracted that trend using a linear filter where we have lambda equal to one ninth 
So this is the influence of four values on each side of the, of the observations. And what you can see is, yes, there is this very rigorous increase over um, regular trend, which does appear to be expanding over time. But you can also see that it's not completely regular, that there are some errors left over in the data. So in order to deal with that, we simply take the average of each of the months across time. So we take the average of all Januarys, average of all Februarys, March, it's April, et cetera. And here's what we get when we do that. So now we've taken that average of each one and just repeated that sequence over and over. So this is what we call called our seasonal effect. And as I noted before, that we don't always expect this to be some nice smooth sort of discrete sinusoidal function, but rather it may have some irregularities. They're still maxima and minima, but it does have this regular kind of repeating pattern. And now, in order to finish our classical decomposition model, we have the remainder, which we can get via subtraction. So there we take the original data minus the trend minus this now regularly estimated seasonal effect from here. And when we do that, this is what we're left with. So this is now the remaining component. And unfortunately, it looks like there's still quite a bit of structure in this remainder. I see some sort of regular components here that starts out quite amplified and then shrinks and then starts to amplify again. And I would contend that this is not a very good model because overall we tend to like our models to have, well, ideally a, a remainder would be zero here, but we tend not to have things look like uh, there's any sort of regular structure. We'd like the variance to be more or less the same throughout this entire time series and clearly this does not look that way. So let's try a different model and use some slightly varied assumptions. The first one we're going to do is log transform those data because as you recall, the trend was somewhat exponential over time and the amplifications in the seasonal data were also input, uh, increasing over time. And rather than use a, a linear filter, we're going to fit a linear trend to the data. Okay, so here now are plot of the log transformed airline passenger data. Now you can see that this trend looks to be relatively straight and the seasonal amplifications are the same throughout the time series. Here's an estimate of our linear trend. So we fit that and we subtract that from the regular, the original data to now have our seasonal effect with error. Okay, so you can see that there is still this regular seasonal effect and there is some irregularity to it, but now it doesn't seem to be quite as bad with respect to that sort of cone shaped we saw before. Once again, we'll take an average of each of the individual months and repeat that sequence over time. So here's now our mean seasonal effect across all time periods. And again, we do see a regular uh, sort of maxima here minima here, and some spikes in between. Here now is our remainder. And while this is by no means perfect, I would argue it does look much better than what we had before. There certainly seems to be perhaps some what we'll call autocorrelation, where these values tend to look like one another over time. It doesn't look to be this fuzzy white noise that we think of as like a caterpillar kind of lying across the zero line. And maybe there's some sort of nonlinear shape to them. But for the most part, there's not much seasonal effect left over. So in summary, today we began our discussion by talking about the characteristics of time series. What are time series? How we classify them? Then we talked about things like trends and seasonality and ended our discussion with the framework of classical decomposition. And classical decomposition is something we're going to rely on a lot in this course moving forward. As we fit various models, we will focus heavily on trying to remove seasonal and trend components or estimate those explicitly, because that may be in particular interest, and then deal with some, and then use our sort of modeling skills to address the remainder portion. And hopefully we'll better, end up with better looking remainders than we did in the examples I just showed you. And with that, I thank you. Goodbye.